Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Juana Matias, the COO of Mass Inc., and I am thrilled to join the Mass Inc. polling group as they share new data from a survey of Massachusetts parents of K-12 students. As we know, schools across the state are back to conducting full-time in-person for the first time since the spring of 2020. Students, their parents, and school staff are doing their very best to adjust to this environment, battling the lingering challenges left by the pandemic. This past fall, the Massing Polling Group surveyed parents of K-12 students in Massachusetts, asking them about their expectations for the rest of the school year. What do they predict about student success this year compared to last? How are students doing mentally, socially, and emotionally? Today, we look at those questions through the lens of the survey findings. After a presentation of the poll results, we will hear from a panel of education experts and conclude with a question and answer portion. So please feel free to use the Q&A function to the Zoom to submit your questions. Staff will be on standby to field some of the questions in real time, while others will be answered at the end during our Q&A portion. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, one of the orchestrators of this statewide education-focused survey, Maeve. Duggan, Research Director of the Massing Polling Group. Maeve, welcome. Hi, hi, Juana, thank you so much for the nice introduction. And thank you everyone who has joined us this morning. I am going to go ahead and share my screen uh, so that we can look at these slides all together. And let me put this in slideshow mode. Great. Uh, okay, so uh, as Juana said, my name is Maeve Duggan. I am research director at the Massing Polling Group, and I'm going to be walking you through our findings today of our latest poll of parents uh, in Massachusetts. So a little bit of the background on today's survey. These results are based on a statewide poll of just about 1,500 parents of school-aged children uh, statewide, and this includes oversamples of Black, Latino, and Asian parents. This is the fifth in a series of polls that we've done uh, in partnership with the Education Trust and uh, from our sponsor, the Barr Foundation. Our first wave was back in May and June of 2020, so we've been tracking all of these education trends um, for the better part of the pandemic. This particular wave was conducted uh, from mid-October mid-October to early November. And I just wanna take a note on the field dates because we will be discussing um, some data on vaccines. And just to note that uh, the eligibility uh, for kids ages five to 11 um, did change during our field period. It was right on the last day. Um, so when we get to that portion, I'll remind the group, but I did want to make a note of it here at the top just to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, my thanks again to the Barr Foundation and the Education Trust, and uh, with that, I will keep us moving. Um, I'm going to skip the key findings for now since we're going to be talking through all of this, uh, but this presentation is being recorded and these slides will be posted along with that recording on our website after this event concludes uh, at massincpolling.com slash education. Okay, to, to start us off, uh, the big takeaway here is that parents are very optimistic about the year ahead. Uh, we found that 35% of parents expect that their child will be ahead of grade level by the end of the year. Um, this not only represents a pretty notable bump from the 20% of parents who say that about their child now, it also represents an increase from the proportion of parents who said this even before COVID began. So on this chart, if you're looking at kind of this light pink line in the middle, you can see that 35% all the way to the right, that's the proportion who expect their child to be ahead of grade level by the end of the year. And you can see how that's higher, not only um, from the figure in October, but also all the way to the left of the chart, that 28% of parents who said their child was ahead of grade level uh, even before the pandemic began. I do want to note that when we talk about grade level throughout this presentation, um, we mean uh, that it's parent perception of their child's achievement. Um, this is not based on diagnostics or any type of assessment. This is based on how parents perceive their child's progress in the classroom. So <clears throat> to stay on this uh, theme for a moment, 
In particular, if we look at parents who's, uh, who currently believe that their child is behind grade level, so those kids who might have the most catching up to do, we see just how optimistic parents are. Half of those parents who say that their child is currently behind expect them to catch up by the end of the year, and another 13% expect those kids to be ahead of grade level. Um, so this is pretty notable that across the board, even those parents who, who think that their children might have the most catching up to do still see a year of real achievement ahead. Another way to look at this um, is parent optimism, that they think uh, their child coming back to school has had a really positive impact. As you can see, that far left-hand bar, um, just over half of parents say that the return to school has had a major positive impact on their child. If we combine that um, with the folks who say there's been even a minor positive impact, um, this means that just about three quarters of parents think that there has been a positive impact from this return to school. That being said, I do want to point out the 13% of parents who say that the return to school has made no difference, and we'll get into why they might think that uh, in the next few slides. And also toward the right-hand side of this graph, those 9% of parents um, who say that there's actually been a negative impact on their child. So what is behind these impressions? Uh, we first turn to parents who say that there has been a positive impact on their child. In open-ended questions, we ask them to tell us a little bit why. And far and away, the top reason that parents who gave it this positive rating say so um, is because of this socialization aspect. Kids are back in the classroom, they can play with their friends, they can interact directly with their teachers. And this is something that had come up um, in over the whole course of this work that we've been doing, especially in focus groups that we conducted last year, where we heard from parents about how much their child was missing socialization. So for all kids to now be back in person in the classroom, this socialization aspect is really important to parents. Um, we also heard things like it's a more supportive learning environment, their child can focus better, they have more hands-on help from the teacher, um, they're getting more feedback, things like that. Um, and then uh, just a note, since so much of the previous year for so many students was remote or hybrid, that parents were also calling out that shift, um, that they, their kids you know, used to have too much screen time, they used to be stuck at home too much. So just a lot of reasons that we heard from parents in the open ends about why there has been such a positive change. On the other end of the spectrum, of course, are the 9% of parents who said that uh, the return to school has had a negative impact on their child. Um, when we look at their open-ended comments, the top reason here is having some sort of mental, emotional, or behavioral health issue. Um, so just, it is notable that there's a certain segment of children who are finding the transition back into the classroom overwhelming or stressful or having a more difficult time with it. Um, very close to the top of reasons was also mentioned uh, COVID concerns, either that parents uh, saying that their kids couldn't be vaccinated yet, which we'll address later on in the presentation, um, or children feeling scared to get COVID or feeling nervous throughout the day. Um, and then just another interesting one, uh, besides academic concerns, this fourth row down about inconsistency. Um, of course, as any parents who are joining us may know, uh, schools have had different protocols in terms of testing or quarantining, um, things like that. And so that was also a reason that, parent li that parents listed of having that inconsistency in the school days uh, taking its toll on uh, their students. And then lastly, with these open ends, uh, the parents who said that there's been no difference, we really heard from them different variations on the same theme that uh, not much has changed, whether that has to do with the situation, like their child has always had good academics, they still have the same friends this year as last year, um, whether that's about the school environment. As we know, a number of schools returned to in-person learning at some point last year. So for those students, there might not be as dramatic a change. Um, we're also just the qualities of the child, that parents think that their child is particularly adaptable, is well-motivated, uh, and then I, I would like to point out that a number of parents on second thought did come up with some negatives or positives once we pushed them on it a little bit. 
Um, but overall, the story here is that for, for a certain segment of kids, um, a lot has stayed the same. And then just to show you some of the direct quotes from parents, um, you can see that we grab just a few uh, from the positive end, from the negative end, and from the no difference in the middle. And you can see those themes being reflected, you know, one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher um, on the positive end, having a hard time emotionally on the negative end, uh, and on the no different side of things, uh, saying that, you know, my child's very self-educated, very good at learning. So given all of this optimism and these high expectations, do parents think that schools are prepared for the year ahead? Um, we found that just over half of parents, 54%, do think that schools are doing enough to help children catch up academically. However, this still leaves about a third of parents who say that schools should be doing more. We were also interested in how parents are making these assessments. So we first asked them what types of information they receive about their child in terms of their academics. We found that, as you might expect, things like classroom grades or comments or notes from the teacher are relatively common. Um, other things like diagnostic assessments or MCAS results are a bit less common. I do want to note that um, at this point in time, MCAS results may not yet have been given to parents. Um, and also that when we look at this uh, by the age of the child, parents of older kids are relying a little bit more on uh, or excuse me, are more a little bit more likely to receive those classroom grades and notes from a teacher. This could also have to do with um, how often older kids are required to take MCAS or other diagnostics compared to the younger grades, um, where we know that especially in those middle school years, um, they're taking MCAS more frequently. And then this slide looks uh, somewhat uh, similar to the previous one. However, we specifically asked parents um, what information they're using to actually judge their child's academic progress. So not just what information do you receive, but how are you processing that information? How are you putting it together in order to form a picture of, of how your child is doing? Again, we see that grades and notes from the teacher across the board um, are more prominent when, when parents are making these assessments. Um, but some about a third of parents are using some sort of diagnostic assessment and 20% are incorporating MCAS results. We also wanted to take a look at different types of resources that might be available to students that we know are key in terms of academic achievement. This is things like small class sizes or personalized learning, um, whether that's small group learning or one-on-one -on -one tutoring, and also having any extra support classes or extra time in certain subjects like math or reading. And on this chart in particular, I want to uh, turn your attention to that blue bar. That's the proportion of parents who say that this service is unavailable to their child at school. So for instance, if we look at that bottom bar, 22% of parents say that one-on-one -on -one tutoring is not available to their child at school. If we then take a look at the gray bar, that's the proportion of parents who just say they're unsure. They don't know what's available at their child's school. So if we combine the blue and the gray, um, the proportion of parents who either say that a service is unavailable or they don't know, across the board, it's about you know, a, thir a third of parents or more um, don't have this type of information or are, un or are saying that these services are unavailable. We also see differences here depending on school type, um, where public school students are less likely, or parents of public school students are less likely to say that their children are using these resources or have these resources available to them. I think this is most clear on that bottom bar, the small class sizes, where you can see Catholic and private school parents um, being more likely to say that this is available to them uh, compared with public school parents. And here we look at uh, the resources in terms of uh, where parents think their child is uh, achieving at grade level or not. And this is a pretty stark finding that parents who say 
their child is currently behind grade level are also less likely to report that their child uses or has, a or has available these various resources. So for example, if we look at those extra support classes, for example, 47% of parents who say their child is behind grade level say that they have some sort of extra support class. That is uh, you know, noticeably lower than parents who say their child is either at grade level or ahead of grade level. It's about two thirds of those parents in comparison. <clears throat> The next part of the survey looked once again at mental and emotional health. This is something that we have been incorporating into our work um, throughout the pandemic as we realize uh, the mental and emotional health of children is part of a holistic approach to their success in the classroom. Um, so back in February, we asked parents how concerned they were about their child's mental and emotional health. At that time, about 60% of parents said that they had some level of concern. That has ticked down somewhat nowadays. Uh, it's about half of parents uh, who, say, who said in October that they were either very or somewhat concerned about their child's mental and emotional health. So certainly the trend is going downward, but for half of parents to still say that there's some level of concern uh, is pretty striking. We also asked once again about how parents are balancing academics versus mental and emotional health. Um, and we once again find that the plurality of parents uh, say that they weigh both of those things equally, that they are equally concerned with their child's academics and with their mental and emotional health. Where we do see a difference, however, uh, is the parents who are prioritizing one over the other. Back in February, we saw that more parents um, were concerned with their child's mental and emotional health. That's that red bar, that 34%. Um, in the middle there. Whereas uh, these days, the trend has really flipped. Now we see about a third of parents are more concerned with academics than they are with mental and emotional health. So I think if we take these two slides together, the full picture that we get um, is not that, you know, kids are back in the classroom and so mental and emotional health, you know, that's solved, we can wash our hands of it. Certainly not. It's still a central issue. It's still part of how parents are um, checking in with the whole well-being of their child, um, but that for a certain segment of parents, there is more of a focus shifting toward the academics. Uh, the next part of the survey, we really wanted to explore what parents know or don't know um, about some expected funding that's going to be coming to their school districts via the American Rescue Plan. On the whole, we found that parents um, have heard very little. Uh, only 20% have heard how their school district plans to spend ARPA funding. Um, and we also find a similar 20% uh, have been asked for their input on how to spend the money. So considering uh, kind of the windfall that this funding uh, may represent for a lot of districts, um, parent knowledge and parent input uh, is, is not very robust right now. However, parents do have opinions on how they would like funding to be spent. Um, we first asked them about academics, and I want to point out here that the question wording uh, was a little bit broader. It just asked about additional funding, so that in theory could also include um, any additional funding from the state level, not just that ARPA funding. Um, and when it comes to academics, there's a really clear priority here. 52% um, of parents say that they would want that spending to go to tutoring and extra academic support for students who need it. That's more than double the proportion who would favor um, additional programs like summer school and after school programs, uh, and also more than double the proportion who would like to expand early education uh, like pre-K to more families. We then asked about mental and emotional health priorities. And here, you know, the range is a little bit smaller, um, but we still find that just over a third of parents um, would prioritize incorporating mental health awareness into the curriculum. And I think this is an interesting finding because that's a pretty preventive measure. Um, and it also is something that makes mental health awareness available to all students um, on a pretty regular basis, rather than just focusing resources on students who 
you may only be reaching them at some certain point of crisis or when things are turning for the worse. So I thought that was interesting and tied into um, what we were hearing from, you know, half of parents saying that they were at some level concerned. So it's being reflected in their funding priorities um, that they would really favor this type of um, preventive, preventive measure uh, incorporated regularly into the semester. And then the last bucket that we asked about was post-graduation plans. Um, again, a little bit smaller of a range, but we see that just over a third of parents um, would prioritize expanding vocational and technical education programs, um, which is just somewhat more likely than the proportion who would want to provide extra support for college financial aid applications um, or offer more advanced courses like AP or early college. The next segment of the survey, uh, we were interested in how parents are navigating vaccines for their children. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, our survey fielded at a point in time when um, students uh, ages 12 and older were eligible for the vaccine. And then on that last day of our fielding, uh, those kids ages five to 11 became eligible. So we asked parents who had eligible children um, if they were vaccinated or not. And we found that a majority said yes. Um, about three quarters of these parents had had at least one of their child va children vaccinated and over half that 57% on the left-hand side um, said that all of their children were vaccinated. This of course means um, that there were still parents who had children who were not yet eligible to be vaccinated while we fielded. And so we asked them, uh, do you plan to get your child vaccinated once eligible? And we found that about two thirds of parents said, yes, uh, when my child's vaccinated, I will get them the shot. Um, this of course leaves about a third of parents who said that either they do not plan to get their child vaccinated uh, or that they haven't decided yet, they're unsure. Uh, we saw some demographic difference here, differences here, uh, certainly by race and ethnicity. Uh, also by educational attainment. And then also, um, interestingly, here at the bottom, we break this data out by region of the state. And basically, the closer in you get to Boston, the more likely parents are to say that they do plan to get their children vaccinated. We were interested to follow up with parents who said that they would not get their child vaccinated to ask them why, what was behind that decision making. So in an open-ended question, uh, we found that about a third of those comments referred to wanting more research or more information. Um, some parents still had safety concerns over side effects or long-term effects. And then other parents mentioned things like uh, wanting it to be their choice, not wanting to be told what to do, uh, or assessing how much they trusted uh, different authority figures when it came to vaccines, um, versus how much risk they felt that their child had to get sick. And then just to give you a little taste of some of the quotes, the direct quotes that we saw from this question, um, you can see again some of those themes coming up that feeling that you know their child's healthy, uh, that you know it doesn't pose as much of a risk, wanting to wait to see its effectiveness, uh, things like that. And then of course, these first few months of the school year, um, there's been a mix of vaccine status. There's been different protocols about testing, different protocols about um, safety standards at schools. So we wanted to ask parents if they've been satisfied with how their child's school has been handling COVID safety. And we found that the majority of parents are satisfied and that that even ticks upward among parents of older kids. Um, this could be because uh, older kids, of course, have been eligible for the vaccine since the beginning of the school year, and that might add an added sense of comfort and safety. And then we also uh, asked in terms of how clearly were schools communicating about COVID policies and expectations. Again, we found that the majority of parents do agree that communication had been clear when it came to COVID. Um, so moving forward, I think there's a lot here for health officials and policymakers to think about in terms of um, how to get the most shots into the most arms when it comes to the student population um, and how schools and parents can be a partner in that. 
So I'm going to leave it there for now. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, a recording of today's presentation and this slide deck will be made available at massingpolling.com slash education. Um, they'll be posted there after the event. Uh, there will be a Q&A, so I'm happy to answer questions that have been coming in um, at the end of this presentation. But if you come up with anything later, um, my email address is here on the screen, and I'm always happy to uh, answer directly. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it back to Juana, uh, who will introduce our panel. So thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. Thank you, Maeve, for that eye-opening presentation, such, such rich information that can help inform both locally and at a state level what our teachers, parents, and students face. Um, audience, I want to remind you to feel free to leave any questions you have in the Q&A box. For now, we have the pleasure of digging deeper into the context of these results with an expert panel led by a true leader in education, Natasha Ushudmerski, State Director for Massachusetts at the Education Trust. Natasha, I'll let you do the honors of introducing our esteemed panel. Thank you for being here and welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, in my capacity as State Director for Massachusetts at Ed Trust, I have the privilege of supporting the work of the Massachusetts Education Equity Partnership, a collective effort of social justice, education, and civil rights organizations from across the state that are working together to advance opportunity uh, for students who have historically been underserved in our schools. And I am honored to um, invite three of our partners to the the stage now to join me for this panel. Uh, first, I would like to invite Hilda Ramirez, who is the Executive Director of the Latino Education Institute, to join us. And then next, Kevin Murray, uh, who is the Executive Director of Massachusetts Advocates for Children. And finally, Latonya Naylor, um, who is the founder and CEO of Parent Villages and is also a school committee member in Springfield, Massachusetts. Welcome, thank you so much for being here. Um, without further ado, I wanna first just open up the floor um, and would love to hear from you just any general reflections. As you look at the results of this poll, what jumps out to you? Um, and Hilda, I was wondering if we could start with you. Sure, so I'm Hilda Ramirez and I re represent the Latino Education Institute at Worcester State University. We work with K through 12 students and college students and families and we help them through college and career success. And what strikes me in the presentation is obviously the a little bit of the disconnection that exists between the funding um, and, 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 the, and the conditions of education, right? And the, you know, the fact that we're getting this funding because of the pandemic and that there's very little um, attention or voices or, of parents and students around how to use this uh, funding. And so I think that that's really important for us to really think about and, and really advocate for the needs of some of these parents. But I mean, another you know, thing that strikes me is, of course, parents are thrilled to be to have their kids back to school because that we've gone we've been through so much being cooped up at home without the technology or the devices that we need without the private spaces for, you know, to have the conditions for kids to learn that now that things are a little bit back to normal, not so much. Uh, we're thrilled and we're optimistic and, you know, we have a bright future, but there's still a lot of challenges and I, I'll stop there and come back, but I can share some of the challenges that we hear every day. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Hilda. Uh, Latanya, can we go to you next? Absolutely. So I think back to very briefly how Parent Villages started um, because we recognized through a report that was given, us, given to us by the school department that 7% of our kids were ready for kindergarten, right? And I'm saying seven. So 93% of our kids were not prepared for kindergarten at that time in 2017. And I, when I look at the data, I think about that situation because a lot of parents sent their kids to kindergarten thinking their kids were ready, that they did everything they needed to do and their kids were fine. And I think the disconnect between what parents really understand to be preparing their kids for the next grade level or being ready at the grade level is not necessarily the case. So being able to, to kind of think about how do we bridge that gap of understanding and making sure they know what the expectations are so that they have a realistic um, a perspective as to what their kids are doing and where they're at in the spectrum as far as growth and proficiency. Thank you. Um, and Kevin, curious to hear what you what you think as well. 
Thank you, Natasha. And I, uh, Massachusetts Advocates for Children is a 50 year old uh, children's rights advocacy organization, Boston, based in Boston, but working statewide. And we operate a helpline where we encourage families from around Massachusetts who are facing issues with their children in education to give us a call and see if we can help them resolve those issues. So because that's what we do, we kind of live in that space in the polling of the people who feel less benefited or less uh, content with the way the return to school has gone. Uh, and I think it's important to give that group of people a little some attention as well. Uh, we uh, carefully keep track of the kinds of calls we get to our helpline and the volume of calls. And during this fall, our helpline calls have increased in volume by almost 40% over previous years. And the calls are not simply uh, requests for information about how to get in touch with a particular office or what isn't a basic information about special education, but these are parents and the guardians calling with very complex problems regarding the special education placement of their children, regarding discipline issues that their children face, uh, regarding uh, language access challenges that they're experiencing as their child goes back to school. So these are complicated issues. And I sort of was wondering in the beginning, is this a, or somebody actually asked me yesterday in an interview, is this a glass half full or a glass half empty scenario? And I, I don't think that metaphor really captures it. I think we're talking about people who've experienced the pandemic and are experiencing the return to school so differently that we should understand that there are actually different glasses that we're working with. And if we wanna be concerned about the entire education system, we need to be looking in depth at each of those glasses. And I would say in particular at the people who are in that percentage, however small or large it is, of people who are struggling with the return to school. So that's essentially our perspective. Uh, the, to me, the, I wanna also thank Mass Inc. for this polling, the consistent polling that's been done during COVID with this kind of questioning has been incredibly valuable to us. And I do think the findings, if you look in detail at the findings, there's no inconsistency between what's seen in the poll and what we're seeing through our helpline. It's just different people have experienced both the pandemic and the return so differently. Absolutely, and it certainly feels like as we move into this recovery phase post pandemic, folks experiences are becoming sort of more and more different and we need to make sure that even as we sort of shift to recovery right that that we're addressing the needs of all student population of all families across the state. Um, I actually want to pick up on this point of sort of parental optimism, right, around student learning and kind of this, the perspectives that the parents are sharing that, you know, the belief that most of most kids are on grade level now um, and the certainly that they're going to get there by the end of the year, right? Um, and I'm curious, uh, Latanya, you started to talk, to talk about this a little bit in your initial remarks, so I'd love to go to you first. Um, I would love to just hear what you're hearing from parents and sort of your reflections on where that Kind of what where that optimism is stemming from and what the takeaways might be for for educa educators and education leaders i think the the data that you showed earlier through that report uh, th that mass inc shared was very much similar to what i'm experiencing a lot of the calls that i get from parents um really more so now than ever is really about how can i continue to support my child how do i make sure that my child is getting the education that they need uh, COVID has really presented a lot of challenges. So the attendance rates for kids are horrible right now. I mean, if you have been exposed to somebody with COVID or if you might have to isolate or quarantine. So there's a lot of things right now that are really interfering with the academic process in order for folks to stay safe and in the buildings. Um, I'm finding that kids who are in the virtual school, we have one here and there's a few hundred kids, maybe, maybe five or 600 kids now that are in the virtual school. And those kids were put in that setting because those parents found that it was best for them. So those kids are flourishing, right? Um, but there's a lot of kids, unfortunately, in the elementary school realm who have had to take a lot of time out. They could not get vaccinated and all those kinds of things. So the reason why I say that is that parents have been more engaged after the pandemic now in wanting to support their kids and making sure their kids have what they need. But there also are these other variables and barriers that are were not expected or anticipated, right? But now they have to deal with them because we're still in the pandemic. 
Um, I also felt like the kids have been a little bit more self-advocating for themselves, right? And so I have a lot of parents who say, hey, my kids are in dual enrollment uh, programs or they're looking to get into dual enrollment programs. Can you help me? Um, I have kids who have created college prep programs in the schools and stuff like that because they want to learn more. They want to continue to engage. They want to catch up on where they felt that they've missed out, right? So there, so this sense of belief and hope that we can get back to where we were or even better than where we were pre-pandemic is definitely a very real thing. But there are also folks who, for example, kids who are IEPs who missed a lot last year, right? As much as the schools tried to support those kids virtually, they missed a lot. And so a lot of those kids are still struggling very much. And those parents are really, really in a tough place. Those caregivers are in a tough place. Um, so I know that doesn't give you a clear answer, right? Because people are dealing with so many different challenges. And when you couple that with the social emotional impact of losing a loved one or dealing with a loved one being sick or yourself being sick, and still having to say, hey, I got to focus on school right now. I don't know if I want to do that. Or teachers not being present because they're not there to teach the kids and they're substitutes. So there, there's just so many things that are happening. And I don't think it's a fair, I don't think it's a fair assessment to say, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a realistic assessment at all either to say that we're going to be where we need to be academically, because the reality is the teachers aren't even there as much as they were just because of the pandemic. So how do you have substitutes come in and teach the content the same way that a teacher who's been there for 10 or 15 years would have been able to teach the content? So I, I know I threw a lot out there and, and we have such limited time to really dig in, but, um, but I, I felt like all of those things were relevant to, to help folks really get a clear perspective of, of not only what the challenges are within the schools, but also what our experience for as families, parents, and students has been as well. Thank you. And I think I, that's uh, all of that information, I think, paints a, a clearer picture and a more com complete picture, right, than we can get through a number, a limited number of questions on a poll. So really, really appreciate that. Um, Hilda, you had mentioned before that sort of, yes, parents are optimistic, but there's a lot of work to do. And I'm curious if you could expand on that a little bit and also would love to hear kind of, as you, th as you think about parents' optimistic perspectives, what do you think is the takeaway from that for, for educators and education leaders? Right, I, as I mentioned before, a lot of our parents are also uh, going through a lot. We have to remember that, you know, we, we had a lot of losses in the Latino community. I can tell you that there hasn't been proper grieving of all that we went through and we continue to go through, right? And so, um, you know, parents are also in a, in, in a, in a bad space. Um, we are seeing more and more parents sort of confiding in us that they are depressed and that they need support for their kids because they are depressed. And so we have that going on. Imagine, um, students arriving at this country right now in the first day of school being a COVID shot and a flu shot um, on two arms and um, a, very, a very different way of um, operating, one that they don't know, but one that is a little bit confusing because there is a lot of disruption going on. And as we, if we, if we know one thing about children is that structure is really important. And so while it is great to go back to that structure that they really do well in and thrive in. Uh, that structure is uh, it's being disrupted daily through, um, you know, uh, pandemic situations and and being and also the, the you know the teachers and and all of that. Um, we hear even from our uh, high school students that they feel that so, you know sometimes um, even like their. Um, access to technology, those that, you know, opted to be in those spaces is not adequate. A Chromebook is not adequate for, for what they believe they should have as a tool for learning, right? So they are, and I agree with Latonia that youth are self-advocating. Our youth are saying, no, we want something better um, and we want a better education. And so I think we have to take all of that into context and and, and know that our communities are hurting. The, I know that my community, the black and brown communities around the state are hurting very much. Um, they're thrilled to, to have some sort of normalcy, but that is not coming for us in a long time. And academically, I doubt it. We haven't seen any uh, true assessments that are gonna really get us to where we are. Um, you know, sometimes a lot of parents are not looking at those assessments very closely. 
Uh, we do a lot of work around navigating around that. What is a third grade literacy, right? Well, what, is, what should it be? And I think that that's something that um, it's part of our, the complexity of our education system and that parents don't understand it. And so they're responding to the motivation and the, you know, the, the getting back to a little bit of normalcy. Um, and I think that, um, unfortunately, I think we're, we're in for a long haul in trying to reconcile with what um, the education system ought, you know, ought to be um, as, as a whole system. So thank you. Thank you both. And thank you for all of the work that you're doing, all three of you, to support families through this process. Um, because as you point out, uh, you know, things might be getting better, but we're really far from recovery. And the flow of information is not where it needs to be. Even when parents are getting some of the data, the data is not necessarily presented in ways that is easy to decipher or follow. Um, you know, one, one thing that jumped out at me um, in the poll is, is this data point that shows that the parents who, um, who believe that their child, who are most worried about their child's academics, right, most worried about kids being behind academically, um, are also the ones to say that they don't have access to the supports, the academic supports that, that, that kids need in order to get back on track. And Kevin, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to some ways that, that districts or schools could um, really drive the resources, make sure that the resources and supports get to the students who most need them. That's a big question, uh, thank you. Uh, what I would say there are some <clears throat> there are many really important data points in the presentation that we heard earlier. Uh, one of the data points that really stood out to me is despite what seemed like what we're calling optimism in many of the results, one half of the parents and caregivers are concerned about the mental health of their of their children. One half. Um, <clears throat> that does not to me sit with a situation that I would call optimistic. And I think it points a little bit to some of the answers to the questions that you're talking about. The other important data or another important data point is that parents and caregivers are not distinguishing the social and emotional support of their of their child children from academic support in the way that we want them to distinguish it in some way. Uh, the, the resounding response to that set of questions is, Parents think of them as co-equal concerns. It's their whole child that needs to be educated. Uh, so one thing I think this, and I, and I wanna say from the start, I think school districts are doing a lot right now. They're overwhelmed. I was amazed that they could even open, this, open schools in many places on day one. So it's easy for me to sit in my office in Roslindale or on Kingston Street downtown and say what school districts should be doing. Um, I think they're doing a lot. But having said that it's easy for me to sit there, I will say that there are two things that I, I would like school districts to take and keep in mind. One is this overwhelming need for social and emotional support, what I would call accompaniment of students as they return to school. Um, resources need to be devoted to that. We know schools are understaffed in that area. We know they're having a hard time finding people. Uh, there needs to be a sort of macro understanding of this problem and a, a big idea solution to direct more resources to it. And to me, sort of creating this hard and fast distinction between the academic and the social and emotional leads us sometimes in the wrong direction. <clears throat> the other thing is we've mentioned here, there is this once in a lifetime opportunity for resources. The answer we get over and over and have gotten for years around special education, language access, disciplinary issues, there are not resources to resolve that. That's not, a, that's not an answer that anybody, any school district, uh, particularly uh, more economically disadvantaged school districts in this case, can give this year, right? Um, and we've also talked, the, the poll speaks very powerfully about the fact parents don't really even know that this opportunity exists and they're certainly not being talked to about it. We're hearing every day, and I'm sure your other panelists and you are also hearing, uh, the, the ideas of caregivers about solutions to their children's problems. Um, if school districts cannot find a way to meaningfully engage with parents around these ideas, if, if the priorities for the use of this funds are just set through typical bureaucratic procedures, 
we will miss a tremendous opportunity. I said to somebody yesterday and they sort of laughed at me, this is a Marshall Plan for public education that we will not, I will not see again in my lifetime, right? And to me, the number one challenge in doing that in making use of these funds, school districts will be able to spend the money, no question about it. The money will be spent, but we need to make sure it's spent in a way that really reflects what parents and students identify as their real needs and their own solutions. And what I'm seeing is a lot of quote unquote, first of all, a lot of places where nobody's telling parents anything. And when they are, it's in sort of Zoom meetings where we'll listen to parents. I, I don't wanna sort of uh, uh, stereotype the approach, but it's not the depth of parent engagement and information that we need. And to me, that's a very powerful uh, result of this poll. So to me, it's, it's looking at uh, social and emotional support and academic support together and understanding those as really needs joined at the hip. And second of all, thinking creatively and meaningfully about how we're gonna involve families in decisions about how these resources are used. Thanks, sorry for going on for so long. No, oh, I, uh, I love it when panelists move the conversation forward. And I think you just did that for us, just moved us to our last question, to my last set of questions. Um, so yes, we do have this incredible opportunity. And again, one of the striking findings in the poll, as you point out, is the number of parents who say they have not been consulted and are not aware of sort of what their district is doing when it comes to federal relief and recovery dollars. Um, Hilda, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role that community-based organizations can play in helping sort of um, engage with the community on these issues, make sure the community input makes it into the conversation because clearly, um, I mean, we know that the education leaders often struggle with this. Right, and so, you know, at the Latino Education Institute, we actually had an opportunity to, um, to interview and do focus groups with parents for the Student Opportunity Act, and we published that. We sent it to the school committee, we sent it to the mayor, and we made sure to get youth and parent voices in front of a formal process that's public. I think that's one tool, one way that you can have it. I We also prepare our youth groups to really go to sessions and speak out on behalf of their needs and also um, some parents that feel comfortable with that. I think it's important that we uh, do that. I know that I uh, go to the sessions and I represent to the best of my ability uh, what those needs are, but I always you know, bring along uh, parents and, and youth. And I think we, we have to do that and we have to think critically about, well, what were these dollars for and how are they being invested? I think that, and we have to ask the tough questions and we have to really make sure that if academics and social emotional it is a priority and parents are saying that, how is that translating you know, into, um, in, into districts uh, with, these new, with the new funding? It isn't, it's, it's, they're very, very different decisions. I know like for example, Worcester is purchasing buses uh, for the district and that I am sure, you know, transportation is our number one issue in this city, but I think that we have to really push and say we can maybe have that, but we need this other thing and really push hard to make sure that we're getting what parents need, um, you know, and having them met. And that takes advocacy and it takes training because our parents are not comfortable because they really don't know the information. They don't really know even how the structure, at least for my community, the structure of the school committee, like we just had an election that changed the whole makeup of the school committee. Um, so the people that are deciding are, you know, are different. Um, and so I think it's so important for us to really involve our parents in that process. It's not political, it's civic. And I think we really need to um, do, you know, step it up right now because uh, the stakes are so high um, for, you know, for so many of us right now. Thank you. Um, we are pretty much out of time for this panel. I hope our massing team will not be too angry with me. LaTanya, I would love for you to close us out. My question for you is, for parents who want to engage in this process and whose district hasn't reached out to them, who may not know of a community-based organization who that they can connect with, um, I'm curious if you have any advice for how they can engage in this, in this process. Well, the first thing I want to tell parents is know that you are your child's biggest advocate. If you're a caregiver of a student, you are their biggest advocate. 
And a lot of times parents get intimidated by the school or don't feel like they're welcome. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're welcome, you make sure they know that you're there and you have a presence, right? And so in order to do that, you have to uh, be, you know, the first partaker of engaging with the schools, reaching out to them, making sure they have your updated contact information, making sure they have your preferred contact information. And I know we hate those robocalls, but answering those robocalls or looking at your voice and our text and seeing what they're talking about, because in order for you to be able to advocate, you have to understand what the resources are or what is happening at the school, right? If there's an open house, be there. If you can't be there, schedule a time to be there with the teacher at a different time that works for you because again, you are your child's advocate. And also knowing that every district has some type of parent portal or some type of engagement tool, what is that tool? And making sure that you have access to it and informing other parents who may not know. Because I know that, that a lot of times, even in, in our district, they have a lot of great ideas and a lot of great tools, but people don't know about them. So if people don't know, they can't utilize them. So continue to ask those questions and seek out those resources and how to get engaged. And um, knowing that we have time, I'm not gonna get into everything that I had listed here, but there's one thing that I wanted to say to folks, um, attending your school committee meetings, knowing when they are, being aware of what's happening is so vital because those policies are what are gonna dictate what happens in the classroom. And a lot of times parents don't know, they don't know about the budgeting process, they don't know how to weigh in. And those things have to happen in order for your school committee to be compliant. They have to have open budget hearings, they have to have those things. So making sure you're a part of that process. And last but not least, I would say that before an incident occurs, having a relationship in that building or in that district. Because a lot of times we have a reactive approach to building relationships with our schools schools, which means that they're not going to be as receptive to receiving you as part of the community, and they should be, but they're not always, right? But when you're proactive and going in before there's an incident, then the way that they will deal with you is a lot different, right? And the way that you're able to engage and give suggestions are a lot different. So there's CEDAM teams um, at your schools, there's PTOs, PTAs, there's folks like parent villages that are in different communities. But last, but of all, everything, when you think about it, at the end of the day, you are your child's advocate. So please, please, please do not let any barriers um, intimidate you. Reach out to folks like Natasha, reach out to folks like myself at Parent Villages, and we will help you get over those barriers. So that is what I will say. And what a perfect, thank you, Natasha. <laughs> what a perfect ending. Thank you so much to all three of you. Please stay on camera for the Q&A portion. Uh, Juana, I'm gonna turn it right back to you. Natasha, thank you so much for leading such a thought-provoking conversation. Thank you to our panelists for sharing their lived experience and perspectives. We have a couple of questions from our audience that we want to get to. So let's get started. Um, our first question is actually for Maeve. Um, this person is wondering if there were socioeconomic differences in the responses to all of the academic questions. Thank you for the question. Um, so in terms of socioeconomic and racial and ethnic differences throughout the survey, um, first, all that information will be posted in the cross tabs on our website, massingpolling.com slash education. So I would welcome everyone to go take a look for yourselves. Um, more specifically, I think over the course of all of this work that we've been doing since June 2020, um, we have very diligently tracked these types of differences. In this particular survey, um, those differences weren't as strong and they weren't as consistent. And I don't want to diminish uh, the differences that do exist um, because I'm sure as our advocates here today um, can speak to, you know, one poll doesn't erase uh, what's happening on the ground. I think in this particular poll, we did see so much optimism, we did see so much positivity um, that perhaps uh, parents are um, kind of all feeling a little bit better at, at the return to school. And we'll see how this plays out. We have another uh, survey planned for the spring where we're going to check back in with parents and we will of course be looking at those types of differences again. Um, and then the other last thing I'll say is, is as I emphasized during the presentation, um, all of these results are based on parent perception. And so if you're comparing yourself to other parents who are in the same boat as you, especially at the beginning of this school year where kids were back, um, there was normalcy, there was routine, uh, you know, it might, it might seem a little better than it otherwise did. 
Um, but this was something we noticed and something that we'll definitely keep an eye on. And I would also invite any of our panelists to um, speak to what they've been seeing uh, on the ground in their communities. Thank you, Maeve. Any of the panelists want to add anything to, to what Maeve just stated? If not, I can move to the next question. All right. Uh, the next question is to our panelists. I don't know if Ida or Kevin would like to get us started. We have heard that in lower economic areas of Boston, participation in after school programs is down, and we find this concerning. Is this because there's a hyper focus on academics or that kids are still suffering from mental health impacts and are withdrawing socially? Any thoughts to both Kevin, Latonia, or Ilda on this, on this question? Um, I mean, I can share that I'm in Worcester actually, not Boston, but um, that our programs are completely down. And I think a lot of it has to do with parents being concerned about their kids still being with other kids because there is still a lot of stress around if somebody has COVID or is near COVID, then you have to disrupt the whole thing. And then it's, it, it, it's, it's distracting to parents. As parents are getting back to work, they really want to make sure that, you know, that that um, that structure is working and it's unstable right now for many, many, many reasons. There's uh, we have seen, you know, less um, number of students, even though we're offering more programming. Right. And then we are seeing um, much more uh, issues in the home that are that the kids are bringing to the program that, you know, where, where there's, you know, um, every week we've had a situation that we normally were not seeing before, where we have to troubleshoot a lot more um, supports around for the for the youth and so that it, around mental health around, uh, you know, things happening in the home that requires a lot of troubleshooting by staff. So we've increased the number of staff and we, uh, we have seen, I mean, we were serving like something like 700 students prior to the pandemic and now we're down to like 100. That's how extreme it is. However, our numbers have doubled and quadrupled in, in the service to parents, right? So much more service to parents, much less to kids. Um, and so that's our experience and perspective. The parents need us more than the kids right now. Thank you. The only thing I would add, and I think this is very anecdotal at this point, but we're starting to hear more uh, information that the district in Boston is not supporting after school programs across the board. So there certainly, pro there very well could be a, parent, a parental concern uh, about COVID and want, not wanting the children to be exposed in, a, in that way as well. But we're also hearing, and, and again, I would say, this is not a poll, this is uh, anecdotal response from some people that there, there is, we, we are gonna examine the extent to which the district conti is continuing to provide support to after school programs, because that would be a serious concern of at least some parents if that support was not there. Thank you, Kevin and Ida for that perspective. Latonia, anything else you'd like to add on this before we move on to the next question? Uh, Latonia actually had to jump off to another meeting. So. Thank you so much, Natasha. So we'll move on to the next question, which is, are there a large number of increasing youth struggling with behavioral challenges? And are these instances becoming a legal or disciplinary issue um, that are likely trauma or mental health related? I know that we've seen in the city of Lawrence, um, some instances of, of violence in schools, um, what is leading to this and how do we provide our school districts and students with the support they need so we're not, you know, further uh, worsening the prison to school pipeline? What a good question. That sounds like a question somebody on our staff put forward. That's why I, I look to see what, uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a really important question. And I, I should say that <clears throat> sort of seeing in advance the situation that we're now in, during the spring, we gathered a group of people to sort of look at uh, policy options for an equitable recovery. And there were a lot of conclusions that came from that group, and I'm not going to bore everybody with all those now. But there were two overriding concerns that emerged in that, out of that process. One was that 
uh, in the return to school because of the, the interrupted education that many special education students have received, there would be a tendency to overplay students in segregated uh, sub-separate environments upon the return to school. Um, so that's something that we really highlighted and have worked hard to try and uh, counteract. And that certainly has been something that we've been hearing about through the helpline. The other thing is that many students would bring back to school with them behavioral health issues, behavioral issues. In general, it would not be easy for all children to return to the regimentation of school for a variety of different reasons. And much of it having to do with the way they experienced the pandemic. And our fear was that um, the main tool at school's disposal to address that situation would be punitive discipline. Um, and I guess it feels good for us to have identified that problem in the spring. We would have liked to have been able to do something much more proactive to deal with it. I mean, what we're trying to do is minimize the use of punitive discipline. There is a law uh, under consideration about to be uh, uh, proposed in the legislature that would eliminate uh, out of school suspensions for the students in the early grades as one way of limiting uh, punitive application of punitive discipline. But yes, we're definitely seeing these issues as students return to school. That's the source of a large number of the calls that we're getting. And we are concerned, there've been several, it's not just the Lawrence case, there've been several high profile cases of disturbing incidents that happened in school. And um, in addition to try and minimize the use of punitive discipline, we're trying to promote the use of alternatives to punitive discipline. Both of these things are, dis are difficult in this context. Um, but the answer to the question is yes. Uh, what, the, what the questioner is an asking is definitely happening. It's something that a lot of people anticipated and schools predictably, the major tool that they have is discipline, right? Um, so that's the tool they're using. Right, and I mean, I, I just wanna add too that there's, uh, there's definitely, you know, a climate, at least in like Worcester to remove um, resource officers from schools and that that's very much an advocacy piece right now. And as a result of that, then, you know, you have a situation where then, um, you know, the, the, the there's less involvement of anyone in trying to, um, you know, in trying to intervene in any kind of violence or fights. And so it seems that, you know, while this is all happening, a lot of people are sort of washing their hands about what to do and how to deal with it, but um, which is an interesting perspective. Um, and, and we, I, I am hearing a lot more from uh, again, which we, we had worked really hard in the district around uh, eliminating a lot of the, um, the, the, you know, the suspensions, but we're back hearing on 90 day, day suspensions for a first offense, which to me is just really, really sad. And also removing students from their traditional schools into alternative settings as a consequence to the suspension, which is the school to prison pipeline, which is concerning to us. Um, so what we're seeing, we're, you know, we're seeing a lot more, um, a, a lot of Latinos in that, in that tracking which is very concerning to the Latino Education Institute. And we've done a lot of research on the fact that there are very uh, nonviolent offenses, no weapons, um, it, you know, and, and still we're doing the, the, the penalties are very, very, very large. Um, and so that's something that we're always advocating for, um, you know, restorative justice, um, the, you know, changing uh, systems. We are actually training a lot of young people in the city and circles practices um, as, a, as a tool. And uh, we're doing a lot, but we've had to do that outside of the district because that's just, you know, something that districts are not gonna embrace right now. And it's, it's a sad thing. So it has to be done through legislation. Yeah, it probably goes without saying, and I didn't say it, and Hilda sort of, Hilda sort of said it, um, the, one of the huge problems with the use of punitive discipline is the disparities in the way it's applied. And that happened, that, that's long since been a problem uh, and it continues to happen. And we're fearful that those disparities will increase in this sort of recovery period or return to school period. That's the, the sort of driving force behind our concern about school discipline as it's being applied. 
Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Ida. I think you both bring up really important um, points in terms of how do we handle this in a way that's holistic and that is really rehabilitative for students and continues to keep them on a track where they can continue to see growth academically. Um, and so hopefully our municipal partners, our superintendents, our school district can really work together to ensure we're infusing resources where they're needed to really do right by students, right? Um, so I could not agree more with both of you um, on your sentiment on this. And hopefully we will continue to see this problem be solved in a way that's not punitive, um, but that's really bringing the resources that are needed to give students um, a leg up. That is all the time we have for today. So I wanna thank again, Natasha, uh, Kevin, Latonia and Ilda for joining us for, and for the expertise they provided to today's conversation. Thank you for everyone who tuned in to this event. Do keep an eye out for future events like this. The Massing Polling Group has and continues to put on meaningful findings on Massachusetts residents. And there will be more polls like this to come. If you missed any of today's event, it is being recorded and will be available at massingpolling.com, as will the details from the poll. Thank you again to the Bar Foundation for sponsoring this poll and to our audience. Uh, we hope you have a great day. Take care. Thank you.